Okay, so I think I'm recording now. So, hello, philosophy of biology class. Um, I'm here with Professor Elliot Sober, a uh, professor at the University of Wisconsin Madison, who is kind enough to speak to us today. Um, so, Elliot, we just read a paper of yours called uh, Did Evolution Make Us Psychological Egoists? So, I was hoping we could talk about that paper and any surrounding issues. Um, Maybe you could start by just saying what psychological egoism actually is and uh, what it has to do with selfishness and altruism. Okay, psychological egoism has, is not defined in terms of anything about evolution. And it's a familiar idea uh, just from, you know, ordinary life. Psychological egoism is the thesis that the only ultimate goals people have are selfish. Mm -hmm. The only thing we care about ultimately is our own welfare and we care about the welfare of others only to the extent that that helps us do better so it's not it is not the claim that we never have desires concerning what happens to others of course we do mm -hmm. but the egoism is the thesis that the only reason we do have concerns about what happens to others is the way in which that happening will impinge on how well we do so that's what the ultimate was doing in your definition there? Yeah. So the, the important distinction is between your ultimate goals and your instrumental goals, we might mm -hmm. call them. The goals you, the goal you have, uh, you care about others only instrumentally. Okay. You care about them only because it serves your ultimate goal of doing well yourself. Okay. That's so, what egoism does. So does psychological egoism, does that mean that we're never altruistic? Or what would you think that altruism means? Well, now it's, okay, so altruism sometimes uses a name for a behavior. Mm -hmm. In evolutionary biology, it kind of just means helping others, although that should be refined maybe later in our conversation. Mm -hmm. um, let's just talk about motivation. So if you are a psychological egoist, it does not mean you never help people. Mm -hmm. because maybe helping them will help you. So, of course, you're going to do that if you're right. an egoist. Um, so, what's the, what's, the, what's the alternative to it? Well, psychological altruism is the view that some of our ultimate goals concern other people. It's not the view that the only thing we care about is others. It's not the claim that we're kind of purely selfless, you know, self-sacrificers. Mm -hmm. No, it's the, it's the idea that among our goals, of course, we sometimes care about ourselves, what happens to mm -hmm. ourselves. In addition, we have ultimate goals concerning the welfare of others. So maybe I shouldn't have called that altruism. I should have called it what I called it in one of my books, motivational pluralism. Okay. And pluralism is to indicate that there are two kinds of ultimate goals that people have, doing well yourself in some regard, and also seeing that other individuals do well. So by psychological egoism, you mean all of our ultimate goals are selfish, whereas altruism is just, well, some of them, may, you know, maybe not all, but some of them are actually aimed at others. Yes, that's, that's, that's about motivation. That's not about the actual effect. So I think right, in the paper that we read, but... yeah, in the paper we read, you distinguish two kinds of altruism. One you call biological altruism. And so that's the... Uh, behavior that lowers your own fitness but raises the fitness of someone else. That's right. Right. Let me say a little bit about that. I said it quickly and then put it aside that not so altruism in evolutionary biology is all about behaviors. You don't have to be a, have a mind to be an altruist in the evolutionary sense. It's not about what we care about or what we think or feel at all. So a mindless organism could be an altruist in the, in the evolutionary sense. I mean, imagine a plant that produces an insecticide and it not only uses the insecticide itself, but it spreads it around the neighborhood so that its neighbors get protected from the pest. Mm -hmm. That would count as an altruistic behavior, if you want to call it a behavior, an altruistic trait. And of course, the plant doesn't have to have a mind to have to be an altruist in that sense. Okay. So the second refinement that I, I need to make, and I meant, it's the one I mentioned earlier, is that not all helping behavior uh, in evolutionary biology would be classified as altruistic. And the, the obvious example of that 
is parental care. So when you, the, the, the sort of more careful definition is not in terms of helping, but uh, evolutionary altruism means that you enhance the fitness of some other individual at a fitness cost to yourself. If I help my kids, that's not hurt. That's not helping my evolutionary my ev my evolutionary fitness because my fitness is defined in terms of my reproductive success. Mm -hmm. so helping your kids makes perfect sense from the point of view of evolutionary selfishness. Mm -hmm. You're trying to maximize your reproductive success. Of course, you're going to take care of your kids. Mm -hmm. So not all helping behavior counts as evolutionarily alt altruistic according to the definition. Yeah, so uh, before we read your paper, we read The Selfish Gene uh, by Richard Dawkins. So there, I mean, he's talking about altruism and selfishness, but would you say that he's always talking about the biological version, right? He, I think he kind of mentions over and over again, look, I'm not talking about motives, I'm just talking about the actual effects. Um, but he does seem to think of parental care as altruistic, and I think, he has in mind something like, you know, this entity, the parent, might actually do worse by, for example, feeding their kids. Um, so you're thinking of fitness in a way that says, well, if my kids survive, that actually enhances my fitness. Um, and I think somehow- I'm surprised, I'm surprised that he would count parental care as yeah. an example of evolutionary altruism. That is not typical in mm -hmm. the literature. Yeah. Let me read that a little bit. Right. Okay, don't, don't think, here it is going to get maybe a little complicated. So right. suppose we had, we didn't have two parents. We organized people or the species we're talking about has one parent. Mm -hmm. I said, doesn't require any qualification. Helping your kids may be the way that you enhance your fitness. Mm -hmm. If so, it's in your self-interest in the relevant sense for evolutionary biology that parental care will evolve. Here's the complication. Think about organisms that have two parents, like us. When you take care of your kids, you're helping your partner to be reproductively successful. Mm -hmm. So there's, an, there's, an, there's, a, there's a kind of opening for the discussion of altruism and selfishness in the context of parental care, but it's not the taking care of your kids and it, it, there has to be another parent, and it's you're being altruistic towards that parent. Mm -hmm. You do more than your share, or you help more, help your kid more than the other one does. That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But the, but the, this complication aside, mm -hmm. it's weird, I think, in the evolutionary context to think of parental care as altruistic. Yeah. Well, he he wants to think of it in terms of uh, you know I've got my body. And from the organism point of view, uh, there's things that I can do to preserve, you know, my body. But I can also do things to help other organisms, and that would include my kids. Now, the reason he says parental care uh, evolves is that he thinks of it as a case of kin selection. That is, your kids have a lot of copies of your genes. And so from the point of view of your own genes, it's useful to sometimes help other bodies because they have your genes too. Um, I'm not sure it really... Well, that's not taking care of your own body. That's taking care of somebody else's body that has copies right. of your genes inside of it. Um, okay, so let's suppose that, I mean, he, I think the more familiar way of doing it is, is to argue that sure, sure parental... Um, well, mm -hmm. maybe from the point of view of kin selection, he wants to say that parental care is altruistic. Um, yeah. But I'm not sure. It's a sure weird notion that. of fitness. It's a very weird notion of fitness that we're talking about here. Since when does fitness just taking care of my body? Whoever thought that? Not Darwin. Right. Not any of the people who talked about altruism in the, in the history of the subject. So. Right. That's kind of yeah. Right. So in your paper, you you know you think a lot about uh, whether parental care is an example of uh, altruism. That is, whether your ultimate goal is to help your kids or to help yourself. So it's psychological, we're talking about psychology. Oh, yeah, right. Now this is, so this is psychological altruism now. Um, so the basic argument there, I guess, is that um, if you have the right motives, that is, for example, you actually love them, 
uh, it could be that that's actually the most effective way of getting you to take care of your kids. Um, right. So but what if I say, you know, lots of other organisms take care of their kids and probably don't love them, right? So, uh, you know, what's going on there when you're comparing parental care among, you know, lizards, is that different than humans? Is there some reason to think that we're special here? Well, yeah, I guess so. I mean, we're psychologically different if we suppose that we love our kids and lizards don't. And it's not that they hate their kids, they just don't have that emotion, that set of right. emotion. Um, yeah, so it's an example that's, I think, familiar in, in evolutionary bio biology um, of something that's called proximate mechanism. So whenever you get an organism that produces a behavior, and the example I sometimes use is sunflowers turning towards the sun, you could say, well, the evolutionary reason that evolved is that that's an efficient way to extract energy from sunlight. But there's a sort of separate, and, that, and so biologists will sometimes say the ultimate explanation of why the behavior exists is that it helps organisms, the organism survive and produce. But there's, there's a question that, has, that that doesn't answer. It's not that that's a mistake, but there's something incomplete about the answer, which is, look, okay, uh, turning towards the sun is adaptive for sunflowers, but what's the machinery inside of a sunflower that makes a turn? Mm -hmm. And that's the proximate mechanism. So the general idea is whenever a behavior evolves because of some fitness advantage that occurs, there's the additional question of what the proximate mechanism is evolved to produce that behavior. So back to parental care, maybe the proximate mechanism in us to get us to take care of our kids involves all these emotions and beliefs and desires that are more or less unique to human beings. Maybe they are. But in other organisms, you get parental care by some other approximate mechanism. So is it that... Uh, it happens all the time in evolutionary. Yeah. Is it that our, our love for our kids sort of makes us even more likely to take care of the kids? Or is it kind of a replacement for whatever other approximate mechanism is in the other animals? It could be, it could be an additional, in an addition to other mechanisms. There's no reason why a single organism has to have just mechanism for producing a behavior mm -hmm. um so uh yeah yeah so in your in your paper i mean the way i read it is that you're you're taking kind of the default view at least the the view that you claim is really common among you know psychology economics etc is that we are psychological egoists and then you're trying to say well look there's no particular reason to think that evolution would lead to that um right I guess I would think, uh, I mean, maybe this is just a sociological question, but you know, why do you think psychological egoism is so prevalent? On the face of it, it seems like, well, yeah, I love my kids. Maybe there's some sort of weird mechanism where it turns out that really it's all selfish somehow, ultimately. Um, but on the face of it, it doesn't seem that way. So well, why maybe, int maybe, int so maybe introspectively, it doesn't seem like we have, so purely selfish motives, but there is this historical tradition of saying things like the following. Look, the only reason you take care of your kids is because it makes you feel good, and if you didn't do it, you'd feel guilty, and your goal is to feel good and not to feel bad, so you do the, stuff, you do the behavior that lead to the, the outcome, the, the, the feelings you like, and allow you to avoid the feelings you hate. So that's the sort of story that defenders of egoism will tell when you see helping behavior they'll say look the only reason you're engaging in it is because it makes you feel a certain way so that that's the hedonistic story so uh i mean do you take that as a pretty powerful argument i know in the paper you're more worried about what evolution would do um but well i think that's a, that's a very influential argument i from an evolutionary point of view it's a bit puzzling could you say more well, why, let's just go back to the problem of approximate mechanism. Here we are creatures who have sophisticated cognitive capacities. Why should the only mechanism we have in place that will get us to take care of our kids be purely egoistic? Why not load this organism up with the ultimate goals of seeing that its children do well? Mm -hmm. We can do that. I mean, you could, you could wire human beings to do that. So 
why is it so stupid to think that that's part of the story and why we take care of our kids because we care about them not as means to our own selfish ends but as ends in themselves okay so i the the, the, the point i think that i haven't reread that paper in a long time but i think that the basic idea is not I'm not trying to prove that altruism, psychological altruism is true. I'm just saying it's ridiculous to, to, to dismiss it out of hand right. because from an evolutionary point of view, it makes total sense that organisms would, would, would evolve altruistic motives towards their own children. Mm -hmm. The most direct, efficient way to get organisms to take care of their kids is to care about them as ends in themselves. Do you think this is gonna apply to uh, non-parental care cases. So um, I think I have friends and it seems like, again, introspectively, sometimes I do things for their good, not just for mine. Um, is the exact same argument going to work? That is, there's no reason to think that evolution would say that it's ultimately selfish. Um, but there, there's, it's a little harder to make the evolutionary argument because it's not obvious that actually helping my friend is really good for me. Whereas with the, in the Kin case, you were mentioning, look, that's part of your fitness. It's not surprising at all yeah. that you'd care about them. So what about non-parental non care cases? Right. Uh, I'm inclined to extend the argument to that. But whether that's successful, I want to leave separate from whether the parental care thing works. I think it does. The work, parental care thing works. What about um, not parental care, but care, taking care of others who are not related to you. Mm -hmm. This is where I want to bring group selection in and say that there's, in human evolution, there's been a lot of work done by groups competing with other groups. And one of the things that's evolved is cooperative behavior within groups. And what, now we ask the question of proximate mechanism. What sort of psychology would you have, what would evolution give organisms who are being selected for cooperative behavior. If they have minds like ours, why not make them care about the other people in their group? Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, the origin, uh, the evolutionary origin of, we might say, fellow feeling, the idea that you, you care about your friends. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the history of this is not living in large cosmopolitan cities mm -hmm. where there are, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and millions of people around you. These are small bands of primates we're talking about. Uh, not all your, not all of them are your children or your or your, uh, your close relatives. And in a lot of human history before ten thousand years ago, which is when agriculture began. Agriculture is a very recent thing in human history. Uh, before that, we were nomadic hunter-gatherers, and we were moving around, and how well the group did, and groups were inv involved in competition with each other. Mm -hmm. That's the opening for group selection in human history. It didn't stop there, but it's the, uh, the place to begin thinking. That's the opening for group selection, and then the question of proximate mechanism comes up. Why? What's our, what, what are the proximate mechanisms we have that make us... Mm -hmm. Um, cooperate with non-relatives? And I think it's the same kind of answer. Yeah. So do you mean uh, cooperation in the sense that it's beneficial for another organism, but also for ourselves, Or do you mean like biologically altruistic behavior where, you know, you're helping your group and you can get group selection, but actually it's, it's bad for the individual organism that's behaving? Yeah, I meant, I should have said altruistic. Yeah, I meant uh, helping others at cost of self. Okay, so you bring in group selection, and you mention it kind of quickly in your paper, but you don't uh, spend a lot of time on that. So um, what's the connection between group selection and the evolution of altruistic, now biologically altruistic behaviors? Okay. Um, the way, so altruism is helping someone else at cost to self, where the costs and benefits have to do with fitness. So, and selfish, if you imagine a group in which they're both altruistic and selfish individuals, the selfish individuals are going to do better because they're going to be recipients of altruistic donations without ever having to pay the cost of being an altruist. Okay, so given that, if you have a group that's got altruistic and selfish individuals in it, 
the selfish individuals are going to be more successful at surviving and reproducing. And so what you predict by this purely within group process of individuals competing with other individuals is that selfishness will go to 100% and altruism will go to 0%. So how can altruism as it's defined in evolutionary biology evolve? What you have to do is move away from the single group picture I just described and have a bunch of groups. Uh, that's what biologists now call a meta population. It's a population of groups. It's a big group containing lots of little groups. Um, and this, what's, what's the story about evolution in a meta population is part of it. It's just what I said before that within groups, selfish individuals are doing better than altruists, but between groups, altruistic groups are going to do better than selfish groups. So you have uh, these two opposing forces within group selection is promoting the evolution of selfishness and between group selection is promoting the evolution of altruism. So you've got these two vectors that are opposed mm -hmm. and what will evolve will depend on how strong the push this way and the push that way are. Okay. So um, maybe this is a good time to, to mention morality. So um, I guess there's this famous quote from Darwin where he thought that uh, maybe in the descent of man, that part of the explanation for the evolution of morality is this kind of group selection thing, Gr you know, moral groups do better. Um, what do you think altruism has to do with morality and group selection? I mean, where does this enter the picture? Okay, a lot of human morality is about taking care of others. I won't say all of it is. Mm -hmm. um, but just as, just as an individual can be, um, just as psychological altruism is something different from evolutionary altruism, mm -hmm. so morality, I think, is different from psychological altruism. So what's the difference between having a morality that tells you to take care of others mm -hmm. and just the sort of person who cares about others. This is a, this is a sort of subtle question about what, it, what a morality is. Um, but I hope it's, I, I, I can't really define that in any precise way, but I hope uh, you and your students get the feeling of what this would look like. You, you have this individual who just cares about others and they don't have any general principles about how they ought to behave. They're just spontaneously nice people. Morality is something more than that. If you think of it as a social phenomenon, not something just of the property of individuals, it's a bunch of rules and maxims and values that a society has in place and transmits from one generation to the other. It's a cultural phenomenon, a mass social phenomenon. And it's supposed to get people to behave in certain ways. And a lot of human morality, it's not just in this society or that society, it seems to be pretty much a universal of all the many human moralities we know about, that taking care of others is a part of the story. Mm -hmm. The scope of morality is different from society to, uh, to society. So you can have a morality in which you care about just your family, a morality in which you care just about your tribe or your nation or your species. And beyond that, you could have a morality that embraces caring about all sentient beings. So there, the scope of, of, of morality varies a lot, but it's, it, it has to be something more than just feeling well disposed towards other, other individuals. Mm -hmm. Why does it exist? I mean, I, and here's a, here's a speculation about that. If we were all 100% nice people, if all of us were super nice, caring people, there would, be no, there would be no reason for societies to come to have moralities. Hmm. I mean, you notice that the Ten Commandments do not tell you to avoid sticking a dagger on purpose in your own eye. Well, no one wants to do that, you know? Mm -hmm. well, moralities are, are kind of there to stop pe some people from doing stuff they might already want to do. So I think the reason, part of the reason we, the social phenomenon exists is that we're not 100% nice. 
and what has evolved, morality has evolved to sort of control that a little bit. Um, that's why it's not just the case that we have, that some of us sometimes have altruistic ultimate motives, though I think that's true. In addition, we're a species which moralities are a feature of cultures, of, of societies. Mm -hmm. It's a good question, like why, why is that there? Why, why did that need to happen? Yeah. In human yeah. Um, well, I think, you know, maybe, I don't want the video to be too long, but now I can't help but ask one more question. Because, so we read another paper of yours called Prospects for an Evolutionary Ethics, where you seem to be really, um, well, poo-pooing the idea that evolution could really help you understand, you know, the source of ethical truths. Um, so there, maybe that was more of a meta-ethics thing. You know, you talked about realism and conventionalism and uh, subjectivism and said, well, look, evolution doesn't favor one or the other. Um, but now it seems like you're giving this story about the evolution of morality. So maybe it seems like they are connected. What's the, you know, why didn't you just undermine your previous paper? <laughs> Maybe I did. Well, uh, not, I don't think you did. I think. <laughs> um, so w the starting point for me on questions like this is Hume's distinction of ought from is mm -hmm. and the idea being you cannot derive an ought statement from purely is premises. Right. So when we talk about why morality exists, we're talking about is propositions. It's just like asking why photosynthesis exists. It's a feature of some organisms. Why is it? But, and maybe, maybe not only can evolution explain photosynthesis, it can explain why organisms like us have this thing called morality. It's a separate question whether any of our moral beliefs are actually true. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get into the normative question of whether we really do have moral obligations to behave this way rather than that way. And, and I don't think that's why bio, that biology doesn't answer that question. Biology can explain why we have these moral thoughts and feelings. It's, it's a philosophical question to me to say, well, why should we think that any of these moral beliefs are true? Maybe they're not. Mm -hmm. So in a beginning ethics class, um, you don't need to really start learning a whole bunch of evolutionary theory and biology. You can just go forward and think hard about the ethical problems separately from that? Or should you really yeah. be informed by, by all, you know, how we make these judgments in the first place? I think that philosophy 101 does very well just by leaving evolution kind of out of the discussion of, of, of ethics, except like you mentioned briefly, the meta ethical question of, of like maybe um, there are no moral facts. I mean, as you know, there are philosophers who have thought and now think that the facts about evolution give us a strong reason to suspect that we're, we're, we're mistaken if we think that any of our ethical beliefs are true. So that's a, that's a way of getting into meta-ethics by using evolution. I think that's, that's, that's a good question. Hmm. Well, um, all the... All the evidence is that videos should stay as short as possible, I think. So. <laughs> but um, I think this was great. Um, I'm very glad that you agreed to do this. And I'm sure that my students will enjoy it much better than me just talking. So thank you very much. <laughs> well, you're welcome, Joe. I enjoyed it. It's great talking to you again after all yep. these, not seeing you. 